Good afternoon. We're here this afternoon at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. It's November 23rd, 1998. Continuing with our Veterans Oral History Project, we have the opportunity this afternoon to interview Jerry Payton. Good afternoon, Jerry. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Can we ask you a little of information about yourself? Sure. Um, where are you currently living? In Natick. In Natick. Mm -hmm. And how long have you lived there? Mm, 13, 14 years. And may I ask you your age? I'm 49. 49 years old. And are you married? Yes, I am. Your wife's name? Lee. And how long have you been married? 18 years. And you have children? Yes, I do. Their names? Uh, Tiffany and Casey. And their ages? Tiffany is 16 and Casey is 13. And where were you born? I was born in Syracuse, New York. How long did you live there? Oh, very short time. Uh, moved to Natick when I think we were, my brother, I have a twin, and I were probably four. At the age of four, you moved to Natick. And yes, we did. your twin mm -hmm. brother's name? Terry. What was Natick like growing up in the late 50s, early 60s? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great place to, a great place to grow up. It really was a uh, small town. Everybody knew everybody. Um, you got into trouble, uh, the police would take you home. <laughs> uh, Did that ever happen to you? Never. Always my brother. <laughs> Um, did you have other siblings in your family? Yes, an older brother Bob, and the younger brother Kevin, and the younger sister. And her name? Barbara. Barbara came along, came along late in life, and uh, uh, she was about three or four when I left home. So. Uh, and what did your parents do? My father was an engineer. And who did he work for? Uh, he worked for uh, various engineering consulting firms in Boston. What was his name? Uh, Robert. And your mom? Uh, Marilyn and uh, she held various part-time jobs uh, in the area, Leonard Morse Hospital being the most memorable. How old were you, did you go through the Natick school system? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you graduated from Natick High School? Yes I did, 1967. 1967. At that point in time, were, did you make a decision that you were going to go into the service or did you have other plans? Uh, it was an interesting time. Uh, I, I th would have liked to have gone to, uh, on to college. Uh, Vietnam was in full swing. Uh, there was a part of me who felt obligated to join the service, uh, and I think that part of me won out over the college. Uh, so was the draft in place at that point in time? Yes, yes it was. And did you enlist or were you drafted? I enlisted. You enlisted. In what age? I was 17 when I, when I enlisted. So you had just graduated? Just from graduated from high school. I was just graduating, I should say. Turned 17 in May. And, uh, yeah. And did you enlist with friends? I, I enlisted on the buddy system uh, with a friend of mine who still lives in Natick. And who was that? Uh, his name was Greg Hescock. Tell us about the buddy system. Well, they, they guaranteed you would stay together during basic training and uh, uh, I think that was the end of their obligation. You, you pretty much went into the service and went through uh, the basic training uh, uh, terror <laughs> together and uh, it went your separate ways afterwards. As it turned out, Greg and I wound up in the same uh, type of job in the service, so we trained together all the way from basic training until the end of our technical school training, which was uh, almost, oh, I think probably nine months. So uh, it was good, it was a lot of fun. And what branch of the service? This was the United States Air Force. And where did you do your basic training? Uh, a base now closed in Amarillo, Texas. So were you in Amarillo for that full length of time, the nine months, or only the 13 weeks or so? 13 weeks of basic mm -hmm. training and uh, shipped off to Wichita Falls, Texas for our, our technical school training. And what type of technical school was that? It was that? an aircraft. So what was a typical day like in tech technical school? <laughs> they, in their infinite wisdom, assigned me as the barracks chief over 90 people. And I, of course, uh, assigned my best friend, Greg Escock, as my assistant. 
So our typical day was uh, we would wake up and Greg and I would run up and down the hall screaming to get everybody out of bed. And we'd go out in formation. I would march them with Greg in, uh, uh, in mirror image of me down to the mess hall for chow and then we'd assign everybody back into their, uh, their flight, we called it, and we'd uh, march down to school and uh, we'd march home again in the afternoon. So during your schooling, were you learning all aspects of the plane? Yes, of aircraft and aircraft uh, preventive maintenance and maintenance and assembly and disassembly. Mm -hmm. Including the engine and things of that right. nature. Mm -hmm. um, so your specialty was taking care of the aircraft. Mm -hmm. During this period of time, what did you kind of like or dislike about the training? Well, we were learning something new every day, and we were around airplanes all, all day. Uh, Gregory and I both were involved in the old propeller aircraft. These were, these were the reciprocating engined aircraft, not knowing that this was the aircraft of choice in Vietnam, and we were lining ourselves up for a quick trip. Uh, we didn't know that. We had no idea. Uh, so we were learning something new every day. We were out around airplanes. We were, we were in charge of, of our uh, barracks and all the people in our barracks. Uh, we had a great deal of, uh, of, of freedom because we were in charge. So and you were 17 years old we're in 17, charge. 17, yeah. yeah. And were most of these other young men the same age? Were they They were all the same age, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that lasted for approximately from basic through that period of time, you said nine months? Yeah. And then mm -hmm. what happened after that period of time? Uh, I was assigned to a small field in Texas, Kelly Field in Texas, uh, to gain another level of expertise in the service. They layered their levels. Uh, so I went from a trainer to a journeyman, and once you attained your journeyman status, so to speak, uh, you were then opened up and sent to Vietnam, which is exactly what happened to me. Similar thing happened to Gregory. He went off to Griffiths Air Force Base, I believe, in New York. I think that was the first place he was assigned. And he had attained his journeyman's level, and phew, he was gone, too. So uh, it didn't take long. As soon as you attained the proper level, uh, you were shipped off to the war. So when were you shipped out to Vietnam? Uh, February of 1969. And did you know when you were going over where you would be located in Vietnam? Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Where was that? Uh, I was stationed actually in a little uh, special operations wing uh, base called Nakam Phanam. And uh, that was up in the northern, northeastern section actually of, of Thailand on the Mekong River. Uh, and it, it being a special operations and had, having been trained in a, a, an environment that uh, surrounded the separate special operations uh, theater, uh, I knew we would be in support of uh, some of the activities uh, in Laos and North Vietnam and the northern highlands of South Vietnam. At that point in time, was information to the public that we had had nothing to do with North Vietnam or going over, and yet did you know otherwise? Oh, no. Oh, mm -hmm. The information at that time was that we were not in uh, neutral territories such as Laos, uh, and we were not in North Vietnam. Uh, I had absolutely no knowledge of us being in any one of those places. Um, I didn't know we were in those places until I wound up in those places. So I really didn't know what I was up for, uh, what I was in for. I knew we were a special operations wing. Uh, I knew that we were in support of the effort uh, and had some knowledge of the Ho Chi Minh Trail that ran through that part of the world and uh, assumed that we would be doing, or I would be doing, something in support of that effort. But uh, no, we weren't told anything. We were absolutely kept in the dark. So how long were you in the northeast region of Thailand? Um, for, that was my base camp. Mm -hmm. uh, so I lived there, mm -hmm. but I was what they call TDY, which is temporary duty, um, in 
uh, Laos, North Vietnam, and South Vietnam. Not so much North Vietnam. We tried to stay out of there, but certainly in Laos and uh, the northern highlands of Vietnam. So your your main base was in Thailand. Yeah. So tell us about this temporary duty. What would what would it be like? How long a period of time? A day at a time? A week at a time? It it varied from could be a day at a time, and there was a period for three, four weeks at a time, depending on where you went and what was required. So how would you done. go and what would you be doing? Nine times out of ten it would be in support of a, a uh, rescue effort, uh, picking up crashed airplanes, uh, classified information that was on those airplanes, uh, uh, some of the forward air controllers that went down, we'd pick those guys up and their airplanes because it was a lot of classified information on them. Would you be in helicopters doing yeah, this? Yeah, nine times out of ten we went over in helicopters, yeah. Once or twice if we had a good strip we'd go over in C-123s which were short takeoff and landing aircraft uh, and you'd, you'd, uh, they'd plop you down in something the size of Natick Common and you'd take off from there as well. And it was, it was very exciting. Yeah, so. But was it frightening? Scared the hell out of you, sure. <laughs> you were, you were uh, 50 feet off the deck and they'd reverse the props on those things and they'd just drop, they'd drop you. This is on the 123 now. It'd just drop you on the deck, clunk. And you'd all scramble out and get, out, get as much done as you possibly could before you had to get out of there. And then you'd be in the, <laughs> in the seat staring at each other like this and the next thing you know you're all at a 45 degree angle because the airplane is going straight up in the air. Yeah, it was, uh, it was very, very exciting. The helicopters were, of course, a little bit different, but... Uh, uh, in what way? Uh, it was easy to get in and out of, quickly, first of all. Um, dropped my class ring from 1967 in the plane of jars, as a matter of fact, from Natick High School. Um, jumping in an airplane, trying to get out as quickly as I could, and uh, almost falling out of the thing halfway in the air. And uh, everything in my pockets wound up on the plane of jars, including my class ring. Uh, so it's over there? It's, yeah, it's over there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so how long were you in this direct conflict? The 12 months. 12 full months. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't every day. It wasn't every week, usually, every week. So the days off, and I put that word in quotes, so, what would you be doing? Uh, we worked um, six and seven days a week. We really didn't. When I wasn't on these types of missions, uh, we were trained, again, as I said, as aircraft mechanics, and that's the duties you performed. Most guys in uh, Vietnam, I think you'll find, had one or two, three different duties. Uh, pilots that were pilots also had, the pilots who were pilots, pilots were also duty commanders or squadron commanders, and guys in my field uh, were aircraft mechanics, and my particular unit was, in, was involved in flight controls, flight control surfaces, and anything that, that uh, affected the aircraft or its attitude in flight. And that was very interesting work because uh, the aircraft that was on my base at Mekong Phnom was heavily laden with bombs. This was the A-1 Sky Raiders. And, uh, and that, all these bomb loads affected uh, their attitude in flight. We got to know a lot of the pilots, uh, some of the other types of aircraft uh, were uh, World War II B-26s, and we got a chance to uh, do a lot of work and know a lot of the pilots and fly in them. And, uh, it was a lot of fun. Can I ask you, do, do you know the spelling of the area that you were in uh, when you mention it? Nakom Na Phnom? Yeah. Sure. That's N-A-K-O-M P-H-A-N-O-M. Thank you. And that was in Northeast Thailand, That's as right. you mentioned, mm -hmm. your sort of your base camp That's right, yeah. area. Did you volunteer to do some of these missions off the base? Oh, yeah. It mm. was all volunteer? Yeah, most of it was, yeah. Was some there, of it were assigned, but, but a lot of them were, were voluntary. Was there mm -hmm. ever a time when, when you didn't want to volunteer, but you f felt you had to go, or that you just didn't for Sometimes one reason? Sometimes I didn't want to volunteer and I was told to go, sure. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, quite a few times. A couple of times were, were uh, enough so, and I felt strongly about not going that I had written letters. I wrote a letter to my father and, uh, and expressed my displeasure with uh, my lot in life at that particular time. Uh, 
Were you open and honest with your dad in your correspondence with him about what was happening? Yeah, I was because he was a, a, uh, a waste gunner on B-24s in the war. In World War II. World War II, yeah. And he had uh, a lot of experiences that I didn't know about, I just heard about. And I, I began to realize uh, or understand more about him and what he had gone through and why he was the way he was from what I was doing and seeing. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was sort of growing a closer attachment, even though I was half a world away. You were in di direct conflict with major casualties. I, mm -hmm. you, you saw this almost on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Did your preparation, basic training and other technical training prepare you for that at all? No. What do you remember most about seeing the first casualties or, or airlifting someone out. Tell us about that. Uh, I don't know that I was prepared for the terror some of these guys uh, were encountering. Uh, I know I wasn't prepared for that. Uh, I guess uh, my recollection of war was so distorted and, and remains uh, in our society today by, and we've all seen it, Rambo grabbing the M16s and boom, 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 boom. And a guy gets hit and he falls down, he gets up and he goes back and things like this. And it doesn't happen that way. When people are hit or injured like that, uh, they, they, uh, uh, they go through a trauma. Uh, very few of them are, are stoic about their injuries. Uh, I didn't expect people to, um, you, you, you think when you, when you show up in a rescue that you're, the guy is just so happy to see you, he wants to get out. You don't expect people to be so terrified that they fight you because they don't want anybody around them. Uh, I, that was a real shock to me. That was a, a bit of a shock to me. Uh. So when you went on these rescues, did you have medical personnel with yeah, you? Oh, sure. Yeah. So were they in the lead, so to speak, and then tell you what to do? No, our, our mission basically was to get people out, get them out of there. Um, and that's pretty much what we did. Um, we were in support of, these, of the medical rescue people, uh, but there was, it, was, it was so... Um, such a common occurrence that they couldn't handle the entire load. So we would wind up as an augment to them. And, and that happened more often than not. Uh. So with their fighting you because of their trauma, would you have to brace them down, tie them down? Well, of course you could. There were times uh, when we were... Uh, I can vividly remember the fellow that came in with an F-4 uh, front seat, uh, this was an F-4 jet fighter who landed at Nakam Panam. We were responsible for that operation and getting those people out of those situations too. Um, it wasn't all in Vietnam or Laos, so a lot of it happened in Thailand. Um, and I, but I can vividly remember the fellow that came in uh, driving this thing, his uh, back seat driver on those birds, they didn't have controls in the back seat, so they couldn't land the airplane. The pilot, and what I meant by the driver was the pilot, uh, had been severely injured uh, with a uh, round that had ripped his chest open. Uh, I was the first up at, at the cockpit. Um, and keeping in mind that this thing has an ejection seat on it, and if this guy flails about and grabs that ejection seat, he's going to kill the both, both of us. But this man was a big fellow. He was uh, uh, huge, as a matter of fact. Trying to get him out of that cockpit was not an easy thing, yet his chest was ripped open. You could see his heart beating. And he had actually landed this airplane. Nice. Actually, ended this, in this condition. Uh, they had an arresting gear uh, set up at this base where he let his arresting gear down, identical to that on an aircraft carrier, and he caught the hook. And that stopped the aircraft. Of course, we have to go up there, and the first thing we do is throttle the engine down, shut everything off, 
uh, and try to get him out of there. And, uh, you know, it's just impossible to pick somebody up like that. It's, he's hurt. He's traumatized. He's screaming for his backseat guy because he, he had a letter to his wife. He wanted to make sure his, uh, his backseat guy got, got the letter off. And he kept yelling the guy's name, and the guy's name happened to be my name. And he kept yelling my name and, and holding up the letter. And I'll always remember that. And just the sound of his name, just the sound of his voice. You know? Very traumatic for you. I'm sorry, I, I think I drifted there, didn't no, I? No, not at all. Question? Not at all. Very. Mm. I don't want to assume anything. Did he not make it? I don't know. Mm. I don't know what happened to him. The medics got him and got him out of there. Uh, he was conscious the last time I saw him, holding the letter up and screaming. And at this stage, you're an 18-year-old, yeah. if that. Yeah. D did you get a sense, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, though, that you grew up very fast in, in these situations? You know, I never, never even thought of that. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know that I understood uh, what I had gone through until I got back, until I came back to Natick. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, came back to San Francisco. And uh, I, I should probably explain that when I went in the service, uh, Natick was a little blue-collar town. And people didn't wear bell-bottom jeans or boots or had long sideburns and mustaches, long hair. Uh, everybody was just like me. We were a crew cut. We were straight leg dungarees and sneakers. By the time I returned, uh, everyone was into this, what we called the hippie thing then, uh, the anti-war anti thing. We were not political people back here. It was a job to do. We did it. Uh, the so, anti-war thing was happening while you were overseas. Did you mm -hmm. hear anything about it? No. You didn't hear about it over there? No. So it came as a complete shock to Absolute you? Absolute culture, culture shock. Mm -hmm. Absolute culture shock, yeah. Before we get back to your coming home, tell us a little bit more about some of the experiences that you had during your service overseas. Well, you know, I've been asked that. Uh, especially now that Vietnam is, has gotten to be <laughs> the war in vogue, I guess. Uh, it was, I, I've, it was something was described to me once like this, and I guess it's apropos. There were um, hours and hours and hours of, of uh, boredom interrupted by moments of sheer terror. And I think that probably sums it up, uh, just from my perspective. Uh, I can't imagine what the guys on the ground uh, went through, uh, the terror of, uh, of some of that action. I guess I can. I, I did get in, in a little bit of that, but uh, on a daily basis, uh, it must have been something else. Uh, One of the things we hear about in history and in talking to other Vietnam veterans is um, this experience was also one of the first experiences that they had with overuse of alcohol or beer mm -hmm. and a new use in drugs. Mm -hmm. Did you see that happening in your units at all? I think uh, we went through, um, like any kid at that age that, that leaves home for the first time, whether it be in the service or, or college, we went through our, our uh, periods of uh, you know, drink and drunk and uh, I think it had a, lot of, a little bit more meaning for us, though, because um, literally a lot of us uh, didn't know whether or not we were going to be around the following day. So we did it, we did it pretty hard. You know, we, we hit it pretty hard. Uh, didn't see a lot of drugs. I didn't see a lot of drugs. I heard a lot about drugs. Uh, but uh, in my line of work over there, uh, Uh, you, you really couldn't take the chance. I don't think you could take the chance, but it just wasn't available to me. I didn't, maybe I was just being a naive little kid from the little old native here. But, uh, Were you able to um, integrate in any way with the villagers or members of uh, the South Vietnam soldiers, etc., mm -hmm. or anyone else that might be uh, non-combative in Thailand? Um, Interesting. Uh, we we would pick up some of these uh, these air, these aircraft that had gone in in areas that were so far removed from the war. 
uh, that we would we would fly in, and this would be the first time a lot of these people had ever seen helicopters or white people. And uh, the poverty level was astounding. They would come up to you and they'd grab your arms and, and comment on how big your arms were. And the mothers would have their daughters dressed in their best clothing, whether it be a sweater or a pair of shoes, trying to give their daughters off to the rich Americans to bring back to America. It was, uh, it was pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing stuff. One of the other things that we hear is the beauty of some of the land. Mm. Did you, were you able to see any of that oh, yeah. well, while yeah. you were there? It's, 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 just a, it's a Garden of Eden. It was, there's nothing like the jungle at six, seven o'clock in the morning and the dew is still uh, on the leaves. I can, st I can smell it today. It's, it's really a beautiful place. So your weather was mostly warm, hot. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. What about monsoons or? Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. When I first got to knock on Phnom, uh, being a forward base as it was, uh, we didn't have a lot of the amenities, uh, and we would wait until the monsoons to get up under the, underneath the gutters and take showers. I mean, you can imagine the sight of anybody uh, if you could have driven through it during a monsoon and seen all these naked guys out there taking showers coming off the roofs, but we did that. It was uh, terrific, and it was like clockwork. It was like clockwork. It would be sunny and warm, and at 2.30 or 2.15, it would rain like I'll get out for 15 minutes, and then it would stop and dry up. And every day it was like that. Did you have any opportunity to come home or to do what, what we call R&R, &R, getting away mm -hmm. for any period of time while you were over there? Um, we asked, that was a, a constant. We were all always trying to get off on R&R. &R. Um, uh, no, we were, we were not given R&R. &R. Uh, our, our status was that we were essential uh, people and we weren't allowed to take those times off uh, when that happened. But we did get a chance on a C-123 to fly into Bangkok. Uh, so when we, when we get into Bangkok, we uh, took some time off yeah, and prolonged it a little bit from mechanical difficulties we experienced with the aircraft. <laughs> what were some of your greatest challenges during that period of time? I think it's just uh, the day-to-day the, the -day thing, just trying to cope with the day-to-day -day thing uh, and not let too much of it bother you and get under your skin. Uh, you had a job to do, and, and you continued. So it was a very difficult thing for me, anyways, because uh, I, I hated the feeling of helplessness and watching people die, and it happened. It happened a lot. Uh, people that you knew and had some regard for, uh, especially some of these guys that flew the A1s, and even some of the A26s, uh, you, you knew him the day before, or you were watching him take off. This happened, uh, uh, fell. I, I, I liked a lot. And he took off with an A1, and uh, I don't know what happened. Just got off the ground, veered right into the ground, and he was carrying a full bomb load, and he's, he went up. And, you know, I was, here I am at Morris Institute, and I was watching a guy over there at, at the hardware store, and so maybe Payne two blocks blown, away. Yeah, get, getting blown to smithereens, and I had just seen him 20 minutes ago. And that happened, and it happened all too often. Um, I don't know. I often question whether or not it was our haste to get these airplanes in the air. Uh, maybe the, the, uh, the bravado these guys had to get up and help their buddies out that were in support of whatever mission they were going on over there. Uh, they had done something wrong to get up there. Uh, I remember one A26 that went in uh, right off the end of the runway, very close to me, uh, that hit a light cart because he was so low. He had become disoriented. It was at night. Um, and and, and uh, the light cart just spun the airplane around. Pushing an airplane around the air is like pushing a boat around the water. It's not hard to do. And he augured right in. This guy was on his last mission. And you know, you're, you're, I guess it goes back to what I just said. You're two blocks away and you're watching these people die and there's nothing you can do about it. It's nothing. Uh, Did it's you talk about it with any of your 
comrades over there, or no. you just kept it all in? You just stand there and you watch. There's nothing you can say. There's nothing anyone can say. Did you maintain close friendships with those that you were with over there? No. Do you ever see any of them since you've been back? No. You had told me off camera about one friend, actually, who was from Natick. Can you tell us a little bit about your yeah. experience with him? Sure. Richie uh, Reinhardt was his name. Richie and I were good friends. He was in the group. There was a group of five or six of us. Of that group, the four or five of us wound up in the service and then Vietnam. And we had all, all services covered, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. And I came back, uh, or let me back up, Richie and I were friends since grade school and his, and his sister Lynette uh, remains, friend, remains friends with, with me. Uh, teammates and uh, high school buddies and like I said he was part of the group, part of the guys. I came back from overseas, and my experiences in, in helicopters, uh, I saw Rich, he was in the Army and was on his way out, and he had an opportunity for either infantry or helicopters, and he came to see me, and I said, geez, Richie, stay out of those helicopters, because you're a target, and you were. You were absolutely a target. So he winds up in the infantry and, uh, and got killed over there. Uh, I was in California at the time. Were you still in the service? Still in the service, yeah. And. Uh, I, I knew from my military experience that when a, a guy in Vietnam got killed, they assigned him an escort, and the military escort was uh, assigned to bring his body home, and, and uh, uh, he either stayed at a local military installation, or was the, the family of the deceased was expected to put him up or make accommodations for him. Uh, I, didn't, I knew Richie's mom, his sister, and his brothers Carl and, and Phil. And I didn't want to go through that, so I called Carl, uh, the oldest brother, and I and I said, Carl, uh, I uh, I want to bring Richie home. Now, how did you hear about him dying? My mom called, mm -hmm. and uh, and it went right over my head. I just didn't want to hear it, mm -hmm. and I had to call her back, as a matter of fact, and say, Did you tell me Richie died? And, you, and she did. So I called Carl anyways, and I told Carl I wanted to bring him home, and, but that request had to come from the family. He contacted someone over at the Natick Labs and, uh, and the cut orders, and I went to Delaware to recover his body and uh, brought him back. And, uh, Must have been a labor of love for you. He'd have done it for me. But what was it like coming home in that kind of situation? Was that your first time home to Natick? No, no, no. I had, I came home first, and mm -hmm. uh, and when I came home, that's when I saw Richie, and I left from there to Texas uh, to California, and Richie went to Vietnam, and uh, I don't know how many months after that is when I we got the call, or I got the call that that he had been killed. Yeah. Difficult. Well, yeah, it, uh, uh, I, I never expected it. Um, You never expect anybody to come over there. Oh, the guys I knew from Natick, uh, Dennis Higgins, Keith Lemaire, Kevin Lynch, uh, these were all kids my age. Uh, you know, when you hear it, you just, you, you, you stun, it just stuns you, you know. I never expected Richie to, to get it. Mm -hmm. The family appreciate the fact that the person bringing him home was someone that they knew and knew well. Yeah, I think so. I, uh, I, I would hope so, yeah. yeah. You haven't talked to them about that since that time, or? No, I don't think we ever did uh, really talk about it. I mean, it was such a tragedy um, for the family, you know, and, and what they were going through was uh, um, so, so much greater than what I was going through at that time. You know, I had just lo lost a friend. They had lost a son and a brother, uh, a little heavier. During that time period, you're the military es escort, so you have to maintain some stability. Did you find that very difficult because you were so close to him? I, uh, I only found it difficult at the uh, graveyard. Um, 
but I had to maintain uh, my my uh, bearing um, and and called on my reserves and discipline I had learned in the military to, to get through that. To be honest with you, uh, when they played taps, I just about lost it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, how long a period of time once you came home or came back to the states? How much? longer period of time did you have to serve in the military? Uh, I had about, I, I think about 18 months, maybe 24 months. Was that all in California? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So coming home, having been through what sounds to me like a s s very traumatic experience overseas, mm -hmm. and then losing a good friend and having that experience, how did you get on with your life? Well, you know, you can't dwell on these things, can you? you, you did just... you have help, though, when, once you got home, or...? No, um, no. No, didn't ask for any, and none was offered, no. You mentioned in getting through the experience of the service for uh, Richie, um, that you had to call on some of your reserve, and this was something that had been instilled in you mm -hmm. through the service. Mm -hmm. So this was something that you weren't born with. It was something that you learned. Sure, you know, you gotta control your emotions. Uh, and I think uh, some of us are born with more emotions than others, you know. I, I, uh, I had to learn to, you know, put that little part of me into a little pocket or a little ball somewhere and just, you know, don't dwell on it, don't think about it. And, uh, but does that part of you ever come out? In what way? When you're alone or when you have a moment that you can think about some of your experiences. Have you found ways to cope or have you just put it aside? No, no, you, I think you find ways to cope. You think about things. I think about things all the time about Vietnam and my experiences. Maybe it's because we never, none of us, uh, and I'm not belly aching about it, but I don't think any of us that came out of Vietnam, and certainly there's a heck of a lot more guys that had a worse time than I did, uh, had the opportunity to really deal with any of that stuff. You all had to deal with it in your own way. Uh, you've got to remember the tenor of, the, of society in general back in those days. They didn't want to know. You know. They didn't want to know. They didn't want to hear about it. You know? So you, I think you had to put up your own sort of defensive mechanisms, if that's the word. Uh, to try and cope with these sorts of things, uh, and, I, and I, I am pretty sure that I did it too. And there are, there are times, and and there are sounds and smells that still uh, bring back those days to me. You know, um, I just spent uh, in my job. I just spent some time in in Southeast Asia, in Malaysia, and a lot of that was very reminiscent. You know, it no, it doesn't turn. It, it doesn't turn me into a whimpering mass of humanity someplace. Does it just cause like a little this. palpitation of the heart, though? Sometimes you, you, you makes you start, gives you a start, you know. Uh, yeah. Once you got out of the service, what happened? Did you come back to Natick? Came back to Natick, yep. To sure this did. new generation of long-haired, bell-bottomed... Well, I had, I had some... Uh, I had some real feelings about that, uh, and they weren't good, you know. But you know, uh, you know, here was my generation that pretty much turned their back on me, you know, uh, and and did it in a way nobody in, in Natick ever did it, and nobody in Massachusetts ever did it. But when I came home from California or to California first, uh, and then came back to Boston uh, after my tour of duty. Uh, you know, I was uh, jeered and spit at. Uh, a lot of us were. Uh, refu refused service uh, at a lunch counter. Uh, it was it was really absurd. It really was. So I had my feelings and my, I had my arrogance. You know, so I don't know that uh, I didn't get what I deserved back in those days. But do you get the sense it wasn't sp specifically you? It was their feelings about the war, and in doing so, taking it out on you as a veteran of yeah, the I war. I didn't look at it as that, in that didn't. dynamic of fashion. I came back. Uh, there were three of us, four of us, um, and one of the guys was a dog handler. And we went 
to San Francisco International Airport. That's where Trans World Airlines, not too dear away, it was a, some government carrier, dropped us. And <clears throat> we, we literally went out and wanted to kiss the ground. It was sort of a joke, you know, we were going to run out and I was going to beat you to it and so forth. And we were, we were uh, jeered and spit at that time and, and a fracas ensued, you know. And uh, uh, California Highway Patrol took us. And I'll never forget it. The guy in California Highway Patrol office at San Francisco International Airport told us that different times things have changed, da 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 da, -da And he told us we should probably change into plain clothes to fly home. And that was a start. You know, not that we were looking for a lot of accolades. We weren't. We knew things were different back here. But uh, did you change into civilian clothes? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Hmm. So once you got home, did you go back to school? Did you go to work? Did you take some rest? I was anxious to start my life, to be honest with you. And I came back and uh, and got married. I got a job first, of course and got married and really wanted to start a family and settle down. Was this someone that you knew prior to going to the war? No, I met her when I got home mm -hmm. and knew her for a very short time. And, uh, and I was obviously troubled from some of my experiences and, and it's shown through and uh, that, did, that ended in, in divorce. So you divorced from your first marriage? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But you got on with your life. Mm -hmm. Did you go to the work? Or, yeah. And what were you doing? Yeah. I, uh, let me see, what did I do when I first got back? I was, I was uh, installing house foundations. I was laying house foundations for a fellow in town here, uh, Don Carlson, and uh, uh, decided to get out of that. It wasn't really my cup of tea and went to work for a, a friend of my family's who owned Whale and Shell next to the villa. And, uh, just until I sorted things out, and uh, being a good mechanic at the time, uh, and I was, still am, uh, got a job with a local dealership for Porsche up on Route 9, and I stayed with them for almost 10 years. So, and it was good money and good work and a lot of fun. So. Did they give you a car to try out or have? <laughs> ride around in a Porsche? <laughs> Actually, I did buy one when I was there. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I had a, it was a lot of fun. They did a little racing with them, and uh, it was a lot of fun. And what are you doing currently? I'm a product manager for a company that builds construction uh, sizing equipment, uh, sizing aggregates, and so forth. Do you and Greg Hescock, who you went in as a buddy mm -hmm. with, ever have the opportunity or the wish to sit down over a beer or something and chat about your experiences? or? Uh, we, <clears throat> yeah, we talk a little bit about it. My brother Terry is a Vietnam veteran as well, and we talk, uh, he, all three of us do. Yeah, well, but we don't talk a lot about it. We don't dwell on it. Uh, it happens. It stunk. Richie get killed. Uh, was you know. Terry, who was your twin brother, yeah. was he in at the same time that you were in? Yes, he was. He was in the Philippines at the time. When what, I was there. What was that like for your family, for your parents especially, that both of you were in the service and you in a war? Well, Terry was in the war too. He was in Vietnam first, then was shipped to the Philippines. Okay. And when he was out of the theater, I was in. What was it like for them? I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I really don't know. Uh, they, they wrote often, uh, was, which was a great help for me when I was there. Uh, I think that they believed at the time that I was out of harm's way, and I wanted them to think that. Uh, there were a lot of times that I wasn't able to write to them, sometimes weeks at a time, and I know that was a problem for them, but I, uh, you know, I tried to cover it by telling them that I was not good at writing letters, and uh, don't worry, I'm fine, don't worry about it, and, you know, I'd write to my father and say, oh, yeah, I went out and, you know, drank too much of the local beer, and <laughs> that, 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 those sorts of things, so I tried to keep it... Uh, you know, away from them, to be honest with you. How important do you think it was serving in the military, and how do you feel it affected your life? I know you have honed in on that a bit by saying how you've had to get revitalized or mm -hmm. get a strength, an inner strength that you learned. But, but talk a little bit more about that experience. Well, I, I still believe that two years in the military is good for any kid. 
uh, especially today when the kids that are growing up uh, in this little town we have here, albeit bigger, bigger and more populous when I grew up in it, uh, these kids need direction, they need discipline, and they're not getting it. A lot of them are, getting, are being raised by a single parent, and that, that is just extraordinarily difficult, and these, uh, these kids are, uh, are kids, and they take advantage, like every kid will, of any situation they think they can take advantage of. I think the military is good uh, for that, to teach a, a kid a, uh, a, uh, a feeling of discipline. And, and responsibility. Uh, I've done some coaching in town here, football and baseball, and, and that's pretty much the common denominator in some of the young kids that I've been around. Uh, responsibility, some of them don't have it, some of them aren't allowed to have it. I think the military is good for that. I think that uh, it, it, it's an absolute sin to send our young kids off into a foreign land to fight a war that we have no business fighting. Uh, especially not telling anybody what's going on. It was not, wasn't until 1975 until I even understood what Vietnam was all about. I can honestly tell you if my son is drafted into a thing like this, he and I will go to Canada. Mm. On the other hand, and let me make this clear, if they are invading the shores of South Carolina, I'll be there with them. One of the questions that we ask our veterans, um, you being our first veteran of the Vietnam generation, uh, is the feeling, your feeling about the difference of opinion regarding the public opinion of those serving in World War II, the Korean conflict, and the Vietnam War. And I know you've hit upon it slightly, but do you want to add anything to that? Uh. Only that there's a lot of World War II veterans that, that think that the Vietnam guys uh, come back and they're crybabies and, you know, they're, they didn't get their due, they didn't get their just. Well, you know, for every kid, every guy, a Vietnam veteran who cries, there's hundreds like me who came back, who readjusted, who started a family. Okay, maybe some of ours didn't work out the first try, but the second one did very well, who owned businesses like I do who work 40 hours a week, you know, who raise good kids that don't get in trouble, who support little leagues and pop one up football and things like that. Don't judge all of us just by one. Vietnam has been probably the most battered about war. Maybe the only guys who can really relate to us are, in some way anyways, are the Korean guys because they never got their just due. They had a Korean-like conflict but were, they were more accepted, you know. We weren't even accepted. You know, we came back and even our own uh, peer groups were, were spitting at us. Mm. So. Is there one thought, comment, or a memory that you'd like to share now with not only your family who will be reviewing this tape, but those who might be doing research in the future, or even just something to complete this interview with? Yeah, I would hope that our society has grown to the point where a man's military service or the traumas that he's experienced in the military service don't become the defining moments of their lives. I guess that would probably be my grandest hope for our society. Jerry, we'd like to thank you for interviewing with us this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>